Hello YouTube. Today I'm going to talk to you about the worst injuries you can occur while lifting weights and that could potentially put an end to your lifting journey or career forever. It is quite common for lifters to have some pain here and there and tendinitis is pretty much a common thing. We all had to deal with that at some point. But these things are okay. I made a full video in the past on how to deal with tendinitis. For the most part, it's a game of patience and strategy. The issue is that sometimes you encounter a freak accident of sorts that is going to rupture something that you're going to have to get reattached or that could stay like this forever. And it's something we want to avoid at all costs. I'm personally someone who had a ton of close calls with injuries that could have just ruptured tendons or severed muscles to the point where my, my body would have never been the same again. And so I want to take from that experience and teach you guys how to avoid them because for the most part, something that I've found is that with a tiny bit of common sense, of awareness and of practical tips, it is possible to push away that fatality and to preserve your body pretty much forever. I'm not someone who believes that injuries just happen. It makes no sense. There's no causality of injury. There's no God in the sky that struck you down in particular. Every injury you ever had was because of you and something you did. So this also means that if you had more foresight and experience, you could have prevented that injury. Today, we are going to prevent this injury together. By watching this video, you're going to dodge that big, big shitty ass injury that could have actually put you down for weeks and months and years, and this is all going to start here. So, the first type of injury I want to discuss with you guys is the pec tear. For the most part reserved for PED users, you will have noticed that many PED users tear their pec at some point, and it's because there's a big imbalance between the strength of the muscle and the strength of the tendon, which is something that usually is the striking zone of the pectoral because the tendon gives away very easily if you try to max out on bench like an idiot. But I've also noticed that a ton of naturals tear, tear their pec as well. The thing is that usually it's not a rupture of the tendon, it tends to be a, a muscle tear. So it's a tear directly of the muscle fibers and it tends to be localized usually in this area here. I know that because I had a sprain on my right pec and I avoided a tear very narrowly. And the reason for tears for the most part is that you were ill prepared for a range of motion that stretched your fibers to an extent that you were simply not ready for. This is when the tear occurs. And the problem with pec tears in particular is that if you have a severe one, you're technically not going to require surgery, but you're supposed to wait for the muscle to mend. And I can tell you for a fact, for having known guys who tore their pec in that fashion, that it never gets back to 100%. You can get to 80, 85, but you'll always have some pain, some feelings of burning, and it can re itself very easily. I played football, and in football, our lineman coach used to tell the guys, hey, a lineman that tears a pec will never be a good lineman again, and it verifies itself. So you want to make sure that it doesn't happen to you. So first and foremost, you're going to warm up. A ton of natties that I know that hurt their pec, hurt their pec because they don't warm up, they jump into weights that they're not ready for because they think, hey, I can move the weight. I did it last week. Well, yeah, you can, but you can in a warmed up state. Don't be an idiot. Warm up. This is how my injury occurred. It was super dumb. Instead of warming up, I did 135. A mere 135, and that was enough. The pec needs to be warmed up just like any other muscle. This is the absolute ability of the muscle to move weight. But to get to that place, you have to get the muscle to be able to do that, which is warming up. So what do you prefer? An extra 15 minutes or a pe uh, uh, an actual uh, damage to your pec that could actually last forever? I think that the choice is very easy. No need to be paranoid. You don't need to roll. You don't need to do 15 sets of cable flies. Just enough so that you are ready. And then when that is done, the next step is going to be to try to not be one dimensional when it comes to planes of motion. It is a very common issue that I see with people who bodybuild, who take a page out of Polyfto's book and they try to get big pecs by doing only bench. Is it possible? Yeah, I did it pretty much. But it's also limited and it risks 
injuries because you're always moving the same way. And therefore, the pec is only prepared to move in that fashion. So if one way or the other, someday a different plane of motion inserts itself in your routine, you're going to get hurt. And the thing too is that you're a bodybuilder. So why not add variations? Why not do some chest flies? Why not do some dips, some push-ups, some different grips? It would benefit your muscle gains anyways. So please do that. And one thing that I would actually recommend you guys do is try to do an exercise with your body weight that is going to stretch the pecs to an exaggerated amount, but that you're going to do again with low intensity, aka body weight, or with baby weight, like for chest flies. I can tell you for a fact that allowing the pec to open and stretch is a good way to prevent injury. Even though you could think, well, isn't that what causes the injury? Yeah, it does with supra maximal loads. If you allow that overextension with loads that you cannot move, you're going to have a tear. But the role of the pectoral is to stretch and then contract back up. So if you allow the stretching to occur with a load that you can manage, you're training the pectoral to have that ability. This is something that I do myself. And ever since I started, I have no problems with my pec. I used to have that pain right there too that many guys get in between your shoulder and the pec. This has been gone. Why? More opening of the shoulder, more stretching of the pec. My all-time favorite lift for that is ring push-ups. A ring push-up is going to allow you to get the elbow to travel backwards, which stretches the pec's maximum amount. And it also is going to allow you to try to get your hand at the same level of your pec on an horizontal line, something you cannot do with a bench press. When you bench, you get here. Right? So the bar is going to be there and the hand is always in front of the pectoral. So you don't get that maximum travel. If you allow for that to occur, when you get back to a bench, it's going to feel much more comfortable. This also goes for the noobs out there who cannot bench comfortably. They want more range of motion because it starts hurting around here. They cannot touch their chest. It's very easy. Train that portion with an easier weight, an easier mode of pressing. And you will find that not only are you going to get more gains, you are not going to occur as many risks of injury. It is absolutely shameful for a natural lifter to tear your pec. Usually, it's not a muscle group that is so weak. So, apply this advice and you should be absolutely Gucci. And then we can look at a muscle group and a, a, a bone structure that is also, for the most part, in danger when training the pecs, and that is the shoulders. Most people, when they get injured on the bench, they injure their shoulder. That's for a simple reason. It's because their shoulders take over. So the first thing would be to make sure that when you do horizontal presses, you actually train the pectorals. That could be modifying the angle of the bench, making sure that your hands are placed properly, maybe adding an arc to your bench. All of that can work. Again, Mr. Edith over here got injured on his right shoulder a ton of times because I used to bench touch and go. And what I didn't realize is that I was tight at the start of the reps and then the more I would rep, the more this shoulder would portray like this and I would end up moving more weight with this side and I got injured times and times again until the day where I got an injury that was so bad I could barely lift my hand above my head and I realized, hey, you're 24 and soon you won't be able to wash your head. Stop doing what you're doing. I've since fixed the problem and that's what I'm going to teach you right now. All of the things I did are listed here. First and foremost, if you are an horizontal press bro only, watch out because horizontal presses, when done too frequently with too much intensity, are taxing on the shoulders. You will have noticed that vertical press bros don't get those issues. An overhead press guy is not going to get shoulder issues because he actually is working the shoulder directly when he does his vertical press. Not that horizontal presses don't work the shoulders, it works them tremendously well, but the shoulder ends up being the limiting factor and the first thing that snaps if something goes wrong. Whereas in the vertical press, it tends to not be the case. Few guys get injured doing a normal overhead press. It also speaks to the fact that many people prioritize the horizontal press. But this means that you might have to balance the two. A ton of lifters find out that they can do as much horizontal pressing volume if they add some vertical press, whoa, that was scary, some vertical press volume. There are some rats in the garage and they do things sometimes. I should charge them rent, but I can't find them one day I will, and they will face the wrath of the landlord. Now, in terms of programming, like I just said, 
What you also want to make sure is that you don't press too frequently on the horizontal press. A big mistake that I see a ton of novice programs making while well, they have the trainee do bench press three times a week. Why would you do that? It's too high of a frequency. Now it's not that your shoulder is going to snap because of heavy weight. It's just going to snap under overuse and overuse injuries are no joke. The issue with an overuse injury for the shoulder is that once you get it, you're stuck with it for a long time because it's a pattern that you developed. It's a pattern of overuse. So you want to cut that. You want to actually nip that in the bud. The best way is to reduce the frequency of the bench press and to add additional chest work that is not a strict press. For example, again, some push-ups. You can do something like some, some cable flies. All of that is still going to grow the chest, but it's going to put less strain on the shoulder. You also have a ton of variation like the close grip that can work. All of this is important for your recovery. Keep in mind that when you do a bench press or even a dip or a push-up, yeah, you work the chest, but it's not the only thing that works. The shoulders also work. Too many people don't take that into account when they program. They see bench press, they think chest, but they don't take into account the fact that every time the chest works, the shoulders also work. And then they add additional shoulder volume on top of that, and they don't realize that it's too much. So you have bros, for example, who will do bench, and then they'll do a ton of lateral raises, and one day they lift like this and they hear a snap. Is it the lateral raise that hurt you and got you injured? No, not necessarily. It might be the overuse injury on the bench that manifested itself during the lateral raise. So now you took a shoulder exercise that should be safe if you know what you're doing, and it became a actual risk factor. Make sure that you program properly. A good way to actually vary your programmation would be, again, a grip adaptation factor. Modify your grip. Why do you always bench with the same grip? Are you a powerlifter? Are you going to compete with the grip? You can have your main style with the normal grip that you use and then some close grip bench press. It's not going to kill you to do your post bench with a close grip bench and it's going to take some stress off of the shoulder. Another factor can also be muscularity and weak points. Many bros have an overemphasis on the front delt and the rest of the delt and the scapular belt is weak as piss. I used to be like this. It's also the reason why my bezoke physique tends to stray away from that. If you look at my shoulders, I did a lot of work to reduce the side of the front delt and to increase the size of the side and the rear delt. One, it's my aesthetic choice, but most importantly, it was to prevent uh, future injuries and it worked wonders. I don't have any injuries anymore and I can press as much as I want because now the trap area and the rear delt area is much stronger. All that is behind your head that you can't see pulls everything together. It even improves posture. Just standing like this, my shoulders are naturally down and back. I don't have to force the movement. My back musculature, musculature does the movement for me. So make sure you hammer your traps. Make sure you hammer your real delts. Do not make the mistake of actually going easy on them because if you actually are the type of bro that wants to be able to press forever, this is how you do it. This back there stabilizes the rotator cuffs and a stable rotator cuff is a strong and healthy rotator cuff. And then you have the inadapted pressing types, which is something that you need to look at the second you start pressing. Some people are not built for the bench. Some people are not built for, for incline press. Some people cannot dip. It's all in you. It's all in the way your body is shaped and it depends on what you want and if you have the brain to actually understand what is going on. I know many people who look at someone else and, and think, okay, he presses like this and he got big pecs, so I'm going to do it like him. Please don't do that. Please find your own style. You might find that your own style is different than other people. And usually your own style is going to be the one that is going to be easy on the shoulders because, again, Shoulder longevity is no joke. If you want those bad boys to be able to move for the rest of your life and grab things and pick up your kid one day or do stuff like, again, just scratch your head, there are some powerlifters out there and bodybuilders who can't do that. They cannot raise their hand above their shoulder anymore. They have lost that function. So do not be that guy. And talking about joint function that is important to maintain, we are going to move on to the knee. Any type of ligament or tendon tear in the knee is pretty much a game changer. It's going to ruin your life. Even something, not even something major like a tendonitis can be a complete plague to deal with for months and years. So you have to protect your knees. Sadly, with the human body, the knees, even though they are a marvel of architecture, tend to be quite fragile and they don't handle certain movements very well. 
And the worst part about the knee, as you might be aware, is that the tendons of the knee, like the ACL, the MCL, once they tear, they tear. It's not going to repair. They have to be surgically reattached. And a tendon that is reattached is much more likely to tear again. This is something that is pretty common across the human body and across the muscle groups. So you want to make sure you protect them as much as possible. So how do you protect your knees when you do squats or knee flexions? Well, first and foremost, you find your stance. Your stance is your own and it depends entirely on the width of your hips, the way your hip socket inserts. So there's a big difference between male and female here. The way your toes are going to point outside, the distance your knee is going to travel, the amount of forward bend you're going to allow, all of this is particular to you. You cannot squat like someone else. Please don't watch those videos of Olympic weightlifters and think, oh, I want to squat like them. They were bred to do this. They all have tiny femurs. They all have the perfect torso proportion to squat with a vertical torso. You most likely don't have that. And by trying to squat like this, you're going to put undue pressure on the knees and you're going to get hurt. That is stupid. Do not do that. Allow yourself to find where you stand. Example for me, I am someone who needs a narrow to medium stance. I have my toes pointed forward. If I, if I duck feet the squat, I cannot squat properly, all of which is sort of in line with the way I am built. Every time I have tried something else, I got injured. Again, another story of your favorite idiot. I think it was like five years ago. I came back from a break and I had watched some Tom Platt's videos. I went to squat, I put 275 on the bar, which was far away from my max, and I don't know why, I decided I was going to squat like Tom Platt's. So I espoused a very close stance with toes pointed outwards, and I squatted. And guess what happened? My right knee popped, and then my left knee popped. The right knee was fine, but the left knee was a bitch for years afterwards, years. And it was only tendonitis. It was a very severe case of patellotendonitis, but it was just only tendonitis, nothing tore, and it was a complete nightmare. So don't do that. Find your style, don't copy other people, and then stick with what works. And then when it comes to muscular imbalances that could cause some problems for you, something that is widely discussed is weak hamstrings. A ton of people have knee pain because when they squat, the only thing that is going to do the work is going to be the quad, and the quad is being recruited by the knee flexion. So the structure of the knee gets weaker and weaker with time. Therefore, if you add some hamstring work into the mix, not only do you reinforce that weak portion, but you also teach yourself how to utilize it. Meaning that if you know how to hip hinge, you know how to do knee flexions and vice versa. I see many people who don't know how to squat. They, put their, their, they push their butt back before they squat. You're not doing a knee flexion, you're doing a hip hinge. But if they knew how to hip hinge, they would know how to squat. This is also the reason why I love good mornings. The second you do good mornings with heavy weights, you, in your brain exists the clear distinction between this and squat because the good morning is not a squat and vice versa. So I encourage you to do more hamstring work. Do you need to do twice as much as for the, the, uh, the quad? Not necessarily, and don't do that if you have never isolated your hamstrings, but you absolutely need more. It's not enough to do deadlifts and squats because the squats recruit the quads more than the deadlifts recruit the hamstrings because the deadlift is a more global lift. There is more total tonnage on top of that. If you deadlift the way I do with a conv style, you most likely don't go through the negative. So you don't get the stretching portion of the negative for the hamstrings, which is the most important part. Whereas you do get the negative part for the quads on the squat and therefore there is an imbalance created. So uh, some hamstring curls, some hyperextensions, some Romanian deadlifts, some kettlebell swings, all of that are good movements to buff up those hamstrings. And then for the glutes, I'm the type of guy that got a big fat ass from squats only, but if you have a problem activating your glutes, it might also be that your glutes are weak and not prepared on the squat. So you can do something like a burger and split squat. You can do some single leg hip thrust. All the things that are going to chew the flexion of the knee with the activation of the gluteus muscle. And I guarantee you that once that's done, you're good. For me, solving my knee issues came in two ways. We're learning how to squat and then building huge hamstrings and huge glutes that could take over and work alongside the quads. And guess what? Ever since I got to that point, I don't have any knee pain anymore. And that is a life changer. I can guarantee you that. And then for the blatant mistakes that I don't want to see anymore, please do not dive bomb your squats. Please do not go all the way down on the hack squat with no control over the weight. Why are you doing this? 
suffer through the negative. You want to get those fibers to stretch under load. Don't rush it. You're not an Olympic weightlifter again. You're not a powerlifter. The dive bomb is something that can be used for people who want to actually take and harness the momentum of the squat to dive bomb and rebound higher. But for you, the only thing it's doing is, again, it's rubbing you off work and it's putting you out of position. The amount of people I see squat and when they go at the bottom, they control nothing and their knees push forward. I'm like, are you, do you want an injury? Because I can just go into the locker room and grab a baseball bat and shatter both your knees right now. I'll be faster. It's fine to have knee trouble in the squat if you are in control. But if you're not in control and they're pushed forward like crazy every time at the bottom of the negative, you are going to run into problems. The bottom of the negative is the portion that you must be absolutely in control of. So no dive bombs. And in terms of knee cave, you have to control it to an extent because at the end of the day, it's an intention thing. Some people, women especially, have knee cave because of the way their femurs and their legs insert into the hip socket. I would say try to minimize that as much as possible. But for dudes, there is no excuse. Don't knee cave. Again, you're not an Olympic weightlifter. They do it because it maximizes power output. It's a more advantageous position to push off when they're trying to clean a weight up, for example. For a bodybuilder, there is absolutely no reason to do that. So, track your knees outward. Put strength in the sole of your foot and maintain the knee in a rigid position. Don't play that game. And then in direct line, with knee injuries also come lower back injuries. A lower back injury also can be something that stays with you for a long time and is going to be a bitch to deal with. And on top of that, if you try to go see someone to fix it, they're always going to suggest an, a, a surgical intervention. And the last thing you want is to be opened up like a turkey for someone to play with your back and your discs and try to fix an issue that they know nothing about. Most back problems can be fixed with bodybuilding principles and resistance training. And beyond that, every single back problem can be prevented with a strengthening method. I know guys my age who have back problems. 30 years old and the guy has a back issue and he pops painkillers. That guy is an idiot. He could just reinforce his lower back, his arm strings, and have no problem. The issue with us, people who bodybuild or who lift weights, is that we tend to over-recruit the lower back and it becomes a limiting factor since it is extremely easy to tire and it takes a long time to recover. So we want to make sure we preserve it so that we can use it for its prime, uh, prime advantage and prime use, which is to train your legs. If your lower back is sore or tired all the time or injured, how are you going to train legs? You're going to do leg extensions? You think you're going to grow massive legs from only leg extensions? You need that lower back to be fresh. So how do we do that? Well, we make sure that it stays a bridge, not a mover. The lower back stabilizes the torso to allow the legs to do the work that they're supposed to do. This is why people say lift with your legs because they are made to lift and to push off things. Your lower back, although it has this ability, is not the strongest part of the chain when it comes to moving weights. So we want to just have it as an accessory to the main movers. And therefore, exaggerated lumbar flexion is a big no. I understand that you can do it because it's a function of the, the lumbar spine to flex and to round under load, but it also is a dangerous position. There is no point in doing that. It's not like it's going to get you some massive gains in the lumbar spine. You could just keep it in a flexed and neutral position every time you lift. This is a hill that I'm absolutely willing to die on. I know that there's a ton of discussion about rounding not being that bad and this guy does it and this guy manages. I don't care. For the average population, it's always going to be better to have a draconian approach to lumbar flexion and to keep it to a bare minimum. Upper back, run it if you want, but the lower back stays neutral. Because if it doesn't stay neutral, for the most part, what you're going to find is you're going to lack leg drive. And this is actually my real problem with this entire thing. I don't care that you look like a dog taking a shit on your deadlift. What I care about is that this fishing rope uh, posture that I've discussed in previous videos, where you look, you literally look like a, a fishing rod like this, this allows you to use your legs because your legs tend to lock before your back does. And then you're stuck with your shoulders protruded forward, trying to finish lifts on the deadlift, for example. This is in proper form. So it's the same with the squat. If you topple over like a pancake on the squat, guess what happens? Now you have to undo that. You have to flex. You have to redress the spine on the load. And that is no bueno for leg drive, but also for the health of your spine. So don't do this. 
This is practical advice and I hope you guys apply it already. Then we have also the discussion of programming. Poor frequency tends to be the number one cause of lower back pain and also of lower back injuries. And it goes both ways. You can hurt your lower back because you train it too often or because you don't train it often enough. If you don't train it often enough, it's going to be weak and one day it's going to be over-recruited and it's going to go beyond its ability and it's going to snap. Or on the flip side, you're going to train it so much that it's going to overuse itself and one day also snap. So when you program legs, your first concern is lower back. It's the same with the chest. When you program chest, keep in mind shoulders. Shoulders might be the limiting factor in this scenario and the lower back is the ultimate limiting factor. So program with it in mind. You want to be fresh. When you're done then lifting, even if it's maximum load, you don't want to wobble around. I see so many people do that. Guys, I have a news flash for you. That sensation in your lower back and your pelvis after you deadlift, when it's burning and uncomfortable, it's not a pump, it's pain. You inflate, you inflame the, the, uh, the area, you inflamed uh, the SI joint, and now this is a sign that next time you're going to go into the gym, it's most likely going to get inflamed again. This is poor frequency. I used to be the guy with constant pain in this fucking SI joint, and I hated it, and nowadays I have zero whatsoever. What changed? Do I lift baby weights? Did I stop the lifting? No, I deadlift more than ever. I deadlift or I do a hip hinge every two days. I squat heavy or do a, knee, a heavy knee flexion every two days with no pain. How? Frequency control. I know exactly where I start and when I end. So if you have that level of pain, program with in mind the idea that you want to reduce the pain. And with that in mind, it's going to allow you down the line to get more gains because we both know that the last thing you want to do with back pain is to actually train your legs. And that also speaks to the stimulus to fatigue ratio of movement that you're going to do to train the legs. It has been discussed times and times again with the deadlift, for example. Tons of people say it has a poor fatigue to stimulus ratio. Why is that? Well, it's because many people take it too far. The deadlift is a fine movement, but if you do too much of it, now you're out of commission. What is the point of doing heavy deadlifts if you cannot do any leg movement afterwards for five or six days? There is no point. So you need to take a step back and maybe find variations of hip hinges that are not going to be as fatiguing for the lower back, aka RDLs. RDLs tend to be friendlier and also tend to destroy the glutes and the arm strings, but they're not as good for absolute power and development of tonnage overall because they don't carry over to every single pull as well. It is up to you to decide how to implement these things when you actually program. And high intensity is also something of concern. I am personally someone who pushes and tries to promote the idea that lower body lift greatly benefit from reps in reserve. You don't have to go to failure on the deadlift or on the squat. Red, reps in reserve too is absolutely fine. You want to go to failure? Do an RDL. Do a 100% do a, a, a on the RDL. I don't care. Worst case scenario, you dump the weight and it's, it's, it's not... It's sub-maximal loads anyways, so you're going to be fine. Same if you want to destroy the squat, do leg extensions, do a variation of the squat like a, a lunge that you can actually go to fire to and it's not dangerous. But for those lifts that actually put the spine under a ton of stress, don't take that risk. And it also goes with the good morning, by the way. Many people are definitely afraid of good mornings and for a good reason. A good morning that you fell with no safeties can actually injure your back fairly severely because you are in a compromised position. There's an easy fix. Just don't go to failure on the good morning. And that translates to lower back. Never put your, the lower back in a position where it can either get the weight up or snap. You don't want to play 50-50. You don't want to play a toss-up game with your lower back. You only have one lower back. So this is going to be mostly that for this. And in proper lifts, of course, should be avoided. By in proper lift, I mean lifts that don't agree with your mechanics and with the way your body is built. If you're 6'3 and you have long legs, most likely you're not going to be able to conventional deadlift very well. Don't cry about it. It's fine. It's just a conventional deadlift. Just find a different style. There must be a style out there that works for you. I stopped doing sumo deadlifts because it destroyed my ribs. I didn't try to understand why to try to fix it. I just tossed it. I dropped it like I dropped it like it's hot. No lift is special, but your lower back is. So we want to avoid that injury as much as possible. And now we're going to start talking about muscle tears. Muscle tears, which on paper don't look as bad. You think, oh, it's just a muscle. Yeah, but it depends where it tears. Because if it tears where the tendon attaches, 
you are shit out of luck because it's also not going to reattach. And the biggest culprit of that is bicep tears. Bicep tears, the number one fear of most lifters and of people who are trying to get bigger biceps. Because for the most part, what you're going to find with a bicep tear is that once it occurs, the bicep is never going to look the same again. The bicep is no, never going to regain the full functionality it used to have. And even visually, it's going to look like shit. You're going to have a weird dent in the bicep. And just like the chest, it simply doesn't look good. So what do we do? We avoid it as much as possible. And avoiding a bicep tear is just as easy as avoiding a pec tear. You just have to not be a complete idiot. So what I said about the pecs also apply to the bicep. There is a range of motion where an injury is actually quite likely to occur. And it's always the same. It's when the muscle is overstretched. But something that you will find with the bicep is that unlike the chest, you can widely avoid that range of motion. And that is when the arm straightens. I know that many people like to do that because they believe it's full range of motion, so it must be better. It might be on paper, but is it really worth the risk? Keep in mind that 100% of bicep tears occur in that portion of the range of motion. You never see someone tear a bicep when they're here or here. It's always all the way at the bottom, or when they're trying to reverse from the bottom, and it's the reason for that. It's because this is the part of the movement where the bicep is the weakest biomechanically. So technically you're correct, there is maximum stretch and involvement, but is it worth the risk? As a fellow bro and a curl bro, I can tell you that it's not. So cut the range of motion short. Always keep the arm slightly flexed in all situations and you will be just fine. You will find that, again, all of these nightmare compilations of people who tell about bicep are one, from people who are on drugs, and two, from people who do movements where they over-exaggerate the stretch. Like, for example, all of these dig dongs, dig dongs, ding dongs, who do preacher curls and they want absolutely to strengthen the arm, maybe because they try to impress someone, and then both of the biceps pop and they look traumatized. There is a reason for that. There was no point in going that low in the first place. Range of motion exists for developing the muscle. If it tears something, there is no point. And if you do it and you like it and you feel no pain, go for it, but keep in mind that it's not necessarily a good idea. And then you have stupid lifts. Stupid lifts, like for example, doing supinated rows. Why is it a stupid lift? It recruits the lats to a great extent. Yes, you're correct, but it also recruits the bicep in a way where it's not advantage. For example, if one day, for example, you're going to overextend the arm at the bottom of the row and you are a bit too cavalier about it, it can pop because you're using supra heavy loads. You're using loads to challenge the upper back. So therefore, it's not going to be a load the bicep can handle. But at one point, you're going to overextend the arm and suddenly the bicep becomes the main, uh, the main muscle responsible for catching that weight and something is going to pop. It's something you see all the time with deadlifts as well. Why do people rupture a bicep on the deadlift? It's because the bicep is put under too much stress. And this goes for everyone watching me right now. If you're a bodybuilder and you're on this channel and you still do mixed grip, Go wash your face, refresh yourself, and then come back and face your inadequacies. It's absolutely idiotic. And I speak and I say that with empathy because I used to do that. And the reason why I used to do that is because I trained like a powerlifter because it was the only way I knew how to train. I can tell you right now that mixed grip is absolutely idiotic. There is no reason to do that. There are only disadvantages for bodybuilders. Please buy straps. Do your double of the hand and the rest of the time, please use straps. You are just wasting your time and getting in dangerous positions with your supinated grip. So it's fine to do movements like this. Chin-ups are a great motion, but always keep in mind that, again, priorities need to be looked at. Just like when you program, again, for the chest, you have to look at the shoulder involvement. When you do your bicep movement, you have to think, okay, the bicep is working here, how much is it working? And if I do another movement that is not for the bicep, the, but the bicep is involved, what happens if I fell? What happens if it gets over-recruited? All of that is going to protect you from a bicep tear, I can guarantee you that. And then we're also going to discuss the lifts that cause tendonitis in some people. Some people cannot handle curls when done with a certain angle. And if that's the case, don't force it. Don't try to be pig-headed about it and say, oh, it's that one variation that I love. You might love it, but the variation doesn't love you. So switch it. Find something else. There is always something that can work. For me, 
I'm a curse like this, curl my shoulders. I hate it. So what do I do? I do pinwheel curls in the inside. And just like that, I get the same stimulus, but I don't get the pain associated. Understand one thing. All of these guys you see tearing a bicep, unless they're real idiots, they have tendonitis for years and years and years. And therefore, it's something that they knew was going to occur. You might be like this. You might have distal bicep tendonitis, and for a long time you ignore it, and one day it will pop. Don't ignore it. Get to the root of the problem and fix it before it becomes too much. And it also goes without saying that you have to be careful about the amount of work you do. If you're a novice, don't do, I don't know, like... 12 sets of biceps a week, it's way too much. Start with three, then maybe do four, maybe do six afterwards. Build up, it's a small muscle. The tendon is over-recruited for the most part. Allow it to grow before you tear it off the bone. That is the least you can do to your body. And now for the one that I hate the most personally, the hernia. We're going to only talk about abdominal hernias and not groin-related hernias because it's the only one that I have some experience with and the one that I'm actually going to be able to avoid the most since a hernia is a bitch and requires surgery because if you don't get surgery, part of your bowel or intestines are going to get cut in the hole and it can become infected, it can become strangulated, the blood flow can stop, you can develop necrosis and you can die. So it's not something to take lightly, but it's also a heartbreaking moment when you get an hernia, just like when you get any of these injuries. It's that moment in the gym where you sit on a bench with your, hand, your head in your hands and you think, what the fuck did I just do? Why well, you just do, did something stupid that could have been avoided? For the hernia, it's the same thing. Hernias are for the most part genetic, don't get me wrong, and men are widely afflicted by it. Women barely get hernias. It has to do with the structure of the abdominal wall. But just because you are predisposed doesn't mean that you are forced to get one. There is no fatality in injury occurrence. What you want to do to protect from hernia is, first and foremost, learning how to brace. Bracing is an easy thing to apply. You don't have to go through all of these theatrics of puffing up like a blowfish. This is bracing. That's it. That's bracing. Breathe in, nose or mouth, I prefer nose, and then brace down, flex the core, okay? Don't suck it in. You're not trying to look pretty for Instagram. Down like this. Don't have to make a belly either. Don't over-exaggerate it. Strong. Feel like a wall. Get ready for someone to punch you in the gut. This is how you're supposed to brace. And then you can also practice bracing with other movements. Now, right, for me, I avoided serious hernias because I had a good bracing background. For example, something I recommend is you get on a bed, you put your upper back on the bed, then you make a bridge with your body like this, your legs and your back like this, and you stand like this for as long as possible. It's going to allow you to learn how to brace that core area. And it's done without loads, of course, then you can add loads on your belly as you go. After that, of course, when you practice lower body lifts and even upper body lifts, you want to start bracing and doing the Valsuva maneuver as early as possible. Don't do it strongly again. It's supposed to be a casual thing. It's not a life of death thing. But if you develop that skill, it's going to be useful for the rest of your life. And if you want additional bracing, something that people who get hernias tend to do for rehab, you can do some planks. You can do some movements where you have to brace the muscle of the core so that you don't fall. And this is something that I personally don't do anymore because I don't need it. But I still put it in my programs because I see that as beneficial. And then, if a bracing movement is beneficial, we have to ask ourselves, what is a bad movement? Well, the movements that tend to cause hernias are twisting motions that tear the abdominal wall in directions where it's not prepared to go. Don't get me wrong, your abs are supposed to allow the torso to rotate like this. It's one of the functions of the abs. But if you do it too fast and the muscle is unprepared, it can tear, it can open a pathway inside where the organs reside, and that is, as we all know, no bueno. So we want to avoid that as much as possible. When you do a lower body lift, you want the trunk to remain stationary. It goes up and down, not to the side. Your hips don't rotate. Your shoulders don't rotate. This is absolutely essential. It is also something to keep in mind when you pick up furniture. Be careful when you pick up a couch to not try to rotate the trunk to get it through a door or something. This is how people get hernias. Rows are the exact same. You do one hand rows. Be careful with these motions like this, especially if one of your leg is on the bench. It increases the tension in the area and can lead to an hernia. So we want to avoid that. 
It does not mean, however, that we're going to avoid stretching the abs. If anything, it's like arm strings or pecs. These are muscle groups that if you only train them in a positive fashion, are going to lose some of their plasticity. A ton of guys, and I know because I'm trying to get them to stop as I give them advice, who play sports, for example, tear their armstring or they'll pull their armstring every other day. Why? They start to sprint and the, the armstring contracts and lengthens and snaps. Why? It's not used to lengthen. And therefore, what I get those guys to do is, for the most part, Romanian deadlift, stretch the armstrings. And what I found is that it reduces the occurrence of armstring injury almost 100%. It's the same for the abs. You want to stretch the abs. If you constantly just brace them, what if one day there is a stretching motion that occurs? You are ill prepared. You want the body to be fully prepared for anything that occurs. So do some decline seat ups. Do movements that are going to stretch the abdominal wall and force it to adapt. Do it sparingly at first so as to not get injured. But I have personally never heard of anyone getting an, an abdominal hernia from an ab movement. It's always something else. So don't be shy. Keep these in your program. One, for a six pack. Two, for the health of your abs. Hernia are a bitch. You don't want that in your life. Trust me. And the last thing I would tell you, and this little, uh, may be a little bit uh, counterindicated, but it's something that I've noticed myself. When you do a lower body lift, when your spine rounds, the instinct of many people is to say, oh, my lower back. And yes, your lower back is going to have some issues down the line. But more importantly, you have to understand what you do to your trunk when you round your back. Most people think that it takes the ab out of the equation, and that's mostly true. But it's because you now put the ab in a compromised position because they are not doing what they're supposed to do, which is to keep the torso vertical and to keep the torso stable. Now you're rounded forward. They're still working. They're still trying to prevent you from toppling forward, but now they're not in their strong position anymore, so they're put under more stress. Anyone who does good mornings with heavy weight knows that. Even away from failure, the last few reps, you fill your abs. Why? You go down, and as you go up, your abs are fighting to help you get back up without the lower back rounding entirely and the weight going over your head. So it's also something to keep in mind. This is also why I'm so against the lumbar spine rounding. It could also cause an abdominal hernia. And then for the last two, these ones are the most fucked up because one of them is permanent, meaning that if you actually get that injury, it is over. You can just completely forget any dreams of bodybuilding because it's going to kill your aesthetics and function forever. And I never hear anyone talk about it. This is the thoracic nerve, aka the nerve of Bell rupture. And this is a rupture of a nerve that goes be behind your back, near your spine, and that inserts into your wings, into les omoplates, as we say in French. And this nerve in particular can be ruptured doing pull-ups. When you overextend the arm, right behind you, your shoulder blades can rupture the nerve. And if it's ruptured, it's over. It cannot be reattached. It will not reattach itself. And all of the area behind the back that is supposed to be recruited when you do pull-ups is going to be dead. Go look at pictures. Type nerve of bell in Google image. Tell me what you see. It's worse than any bicep tear you've ever seen in your life and it cannot be fixed. It is for life. So be extremely careful. It happens in one way and one way only. It's vertical pulls. When the person goes all the way, they extend their arm all the way and they allow all of the pressure to be put on the nerve at once. Why? Because your shoulder blades move when you do pull-ups. Of course they do because they have to recruit the back and they have to move the elbows in. But what happens when you extend super fast and you don't control the negative? They end up in a position where they snap into place. But if the nerve is misplaced when this happens, it gets severed. You don't want that to happen. So how do we do how do we prevent the nerve of belt rupture? Well, when you do your pull-ups, try to do bodybuilding pull-ups the way I've always taught you guys, it's in the description. And if you absolutely want to do your full range of motion arm extended, it's fine, but control the bottom portion. Don't let your arms just overextend and don't dangle like a turd ready to fall into the toilet at the bottom. This is stupid. It's not even proper form. You're not in control. Don't jerk upwards either. I see too many people do that. They dive bomb their pull-ups and they think, oh, it's proper form. No, it's not. If you did that in a pull-up competition, they would write you off. You have to let the body be in control at the bottom, then re-engage the scapula and pull back up. It also would actually save you some, from some potential shoulder injuries. 
I read some studies to prepare for this video, which is something I never do, and I found something funny. The only shoulder injuries they could actually assess and that actually, they actually observe outside of rotator cuff injuries caused by bench press and dips were injuries caused by pull-ups. People who did CrossFit had a super high rate of shoulder injury. Why? Because it was stupid keeping pull-ups or they overextend the arm and then they jerk back off to use the momentum. Simply don't do that. It rubs you off work because it's not the upper back working anymore, it's the momentum and gravity. And if you're unlucky and you have a disposition for it, you're going to get a nerve of bell rupture. And at this point, you can kiss your gains goodbye. You'll never do a pull-up again in your life. You'll never have a good looking back in your life. So be very careful with that. A way to actually walk beyond that and get that mobility required to go all the way down if you wish is to do some dead hangs. And on top of that, it decompresses the lower back and it reduces the risk of lower back injuries. All good. And then for the last problem, the last horrible injury that I want you guys to avoid as much as possible, we're going to talk about the neck. The neck is a lovely part of the human body, but it's also a part where a ton of nerve endings meet and a ton of discs that are very important for your mobility also meet. So if something drastic happens or catastrophic happens in the area, you could end up paralyzed. We have all experienced that where you move your head too fast and you, you sense a shooting pain down the back and now you can't move properly for a few weeks. Don't matter that much, but if it's recurrent, it could create problems down the line. Pinched nerves are also no joke, be it in your elbows, but your neck is especially bad because that's where your brain is. So it's something, a problem that I've met in my life a ton. If you're the type of person that gets problems in their neck when they do pressing motions or pulling motions, the solution is quite simple. Warm up your neck before every session. You don't have to do a ton, but just warm it up, get it, get it warm and nice. And then when you do the movement, reps in reserve. I know that I get injured all the time on the overhead press. If I try to go to failure, I always get those shooting pains down my back and then I can barely move my head for three days. You know what the solution was? Reps in reserve. I don't go to failure anymore. I, I use less weight on the overhead press. Is it less optimal for bodybuilding? Yeah, but I would like to be able to do this into my old age and not be one of these guys that has to move like this because their neck is entirely fused in place. So it's something to keep in mind with those nerve endings because be it muscle, be it tendon, be it nerve, you want to preserve it as much as possible if you want to be able to make use of it for as long as possible. At the end of the day, a good looking body is great. I'm all about aesthetics, bro. But a movie that the body that can actually move is also quite good. And therefore, if we can get the two at the same time, I think that it's something we should all espouse. And with, with what I've told you in this video, you're going to be able to prioritize your bodybuilding dream without having to cut down on your ability to lift weights and while retaining all of the mobility and integrity in your body for as long as possible. And I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.